Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by the word entertainment. Ron, that is a lot for you to live up to. Can you pull it off? Well, certainly not with this FMM, but hang in there. I just might have a surprise or two for you today. I can't wait. Now, where did I put that marching band? This must be a big case we're headed for, Inspector. Well, you're right in the way, Stokes. I've known old Sherry, a man who's been murdered, for a long time. Isn't he the guy who owned a lot of diamonds? Yes, he had several very valuable ones in his collection. And I think somebody killed Sherry for those diamonds. Any idea who? We'll find that out after we get inside. Hello, Inspector Brothers. I'm glad you got here so soon. Oh, hello, Dr. Matthews. I brought Sergeant Stokes along to help. Fine. Come on in, won't you? The man who phoned me, Mr. Sayers, is in the study where they found Sherry. Yeah, we'll come along after you, Doctor. Inspector Crothers, this is Mr. Sayers who found Mr. Sherry unconscious when he came in. How do you do, Mr. Sayers? Holy Moses, look at this place. Looks as though a cyclone had struck it. Now, um, tell us what happened, won't you, Mr. Sayers? I'd like to get the story straight. Well... In a very confidential capacity, I represent a large diamond-buying syndicate. Mr. Sherry was known to have a very extensive collection of gems, one specimen in particular that our firm wanted to buy. And you were sent to see if he would sell it? That's right. I made an appointment with Mr. Sherry for this evening. He said to come here and that he might be back here in the study and not hear the bell. If no one answered, I was to come right in. He would leave the door unlocked for me. Isn't that a rather strange thing for a man to do who has a valuable collection of diamonds in his house? Well, I thought so at the time, but I thought also that Mr. Sherry was perhaps, well, eccentric. You see, I'd never met him, nor, as a matter of fact, heard of him until yesterday. I come from another part of the country, you see. And he was alone? Completely. You can imagine how shocked I was at finding Mr. Sherry lying on the floor by the desk, unconscious and... The room all upset. When Mr. Sayers phoned me, I imagined that Sherry was suffering from one of his chronic attacks. However, I find that the man has been hit at the base of the skull by a powerful blow, breaking his neck and killing him instantly. You say you are familiar with Mr. Sherry's chronic attacks, Doctor? Yes, I've been Mr. Sherry's personal physician for many years. That was why I phoned Dr. Matthews, Inspector. I knew that he would be able to offer the best help. Mr. Sayers, your theory is a very nicely calculated one. In fact, I would have acted on it if it hadn't been for one thing. As it is, though, I'm holding you for the murder of Mr. Sherry and for the attempted theft of his diamond collection. What mistake did Sayers make that caused the inspector to hold him on a definite charge of murder? In just a moment, we'll tell you, but first... Okay, that one made no sense. Do these five-minute mysteries ever make sense? What bothers you this time? Well, the story seemed plausible, and yet we're holding the diamond buyer for murder? I see. Let me ask you a question. Okay. How did the guy know which doctor to call, and his medical history? Oh, that is a good point. Simple logic. Know the man you plan to murder, but do not let on that you know. Oh, I'm gonna write that down. You're welcome. And now, back to our five-minute mystery. Hold me for murder? Why, Inspector, I told you... I know, Mr. Sayers, you told me a little too much. When you said you had never met Sherry, nor heard of him until a day ago, everything was fine. 
But when you said you called his personal physician purposely, you caught yourself. If you knew nothing about Sherry, you couldn't have known who his personal physician was. Hey, Inspector, that's pretty clever. Pretty clever. Well, BG, you were spot on. Perfect solution. Kudos. Well, thank you, Ron. It is quite an honor to be recognized for my brilliance. Why do you always have to go that extra step? I am not sure what you mean. Don't you, though? I am sure I don't. And that's why you are a pompous ass. What's that you say? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. On the show today, we have some new stuff mixed with the old. We have three listener stories that are tied together in a pretty unique way. I think you're going to be amazed at just how synergistic your stories can be at times. Then we have a 50s noir story that, when published, was way ahead of its time. All in all, I think you're going to enjoy the show. Now, I wanted to take a minute and talk about some things that have been going on. Some of you have sent me notes and said, Hey, Ron, what's going on? You, you just don't seem right. Well, the fact is that I have not been feeling right. But I am on the mend and we'll leave it at that. I do know this. I do care about the show and I do want it to be the best that it possibly can be. I know I had said that there's a lot of changes going to be happening and we're going to be doing some different things. And so far, well, I haven't done anything. It hasn't been that I didn't want to. It's been I just haven't been able to. Some of the changes you can be looking for is kind of a new format to These Are Your Stories. And we're going to be doing some more stuff with Sylvia. That's going to be fun. So... What do you say we get to today's show, and I hope you enjoy it. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? The Sleeping Dragon, Guardians of the Flame, Book One by Joel Rosenberg. Have you ever played a role-playing game like Dungeons & Dragons or GURPS? These pencil and paper games are a lot of fun and they force you to stretch your imagination to the limits. But what if they were real? Just for a minute, imagine that you are transported to the actual place and forced to put your very life on the line. That is the premise of the book, and here is a clip. Jason, wake up! James Michael's voice rasped. Jason Parker shrugged the hand from his shoulders, reaching for the covers to pull them over his head. But the covers weren't there. Want me to try? The voice was Carl Cullinane's, but changed. A deep, rich baritone. No, we'll do it. You go back to your little friend, Doria said. Maybe she's over her crying jag by now. Jason pried an eye open, squinting painfully in the bright sunlight. Doria knelt on the grass next to him. But it wasn't Doria. Not exactly. She was older, gaunt, the rounded features of her face having changed into the well-defined ones of a thirty-ish woman. And her eyes were strange. Nobody had yellow irises, but Doria did, and that seemed... right. Familiar. What the hell? Jason jerked upright, 
now totally awake. Maybe. He was sitting on damp morning grass, wearing a musky-smelling leather jerkin and dew-damp gray woolen leggings, an ivory-hilted short sword in its scabbard at the right side of his waist, a sheathed dagger strapped to his chest beneath his jerkin. He reached his right hand up to his face to slap himself awake. This had all the makings of a bad, bad dream. He missed. Air brushed his cheek. Missed? He looked down at his arm. Instead of a hand on the end of his withered, age-spotted right arm, there was nothing but a naked stump, covered with brown keloid scars. My hand! The world went gray. It all began as just another evening of fantasy gaming with James, Carl, Andrea, and the rest. They were ready to assume their various roles as a wizard, cleric, warrior, or thief. But the game master, Professor Deaton, had something else planned for this unsuspecting group of college students. And the game soon became a matter of life and death as the seven adventurers found themselves transported to an alternate world and into the bodies of the actual characters that they had been pretending to be. Cast into a land where they had to find the legendary gate between the worlds to get back home. A place guarded by the most terrifying and deadly enemy of all. Who might that be? Well, you can have this book today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with new titles. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get The Sleeping Dragon, Guardians of Flame, Book One, by Joel Rosenberg. You're gonna love this one. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories in review. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. For this round of These Are Your Stories, we have a theme. Jesse Owens once said, we all have dreams. But in order to make a dream come into reality, it takes an awful lot of determination, dedication, self-discipline, and effort. This, however, is not what we'll be talking about today. Dreams, night terrors, and other strange events that take place while we're sleeping, or at least trying to, I have to be honest and say most of these stories are pretty creepy, and you just might want to think about leaving your lights on. Like our first story from Michael Blackstorm, who lives in Montana. It is the persona of Creepy. Hello, Ron. I want to share a story with you that might be too freaky. I'm not sure that you want to use it. About six years ago, I was sleeping. My pajamas, at the time, were a sweater with hoodie and pants. I was listening to music and I could hear my dad in the other room watching TV. Like 30 minutes after I fell asleep, I felt like something was grabbing my legs and slowly making its way up to my face. I wanted to scream for help, but I couldn't. Once this creature was face to face to me, I was not able to see it at the beginning because it was covering its face. I struggled with it and finally was able to throw this thing from my bed. I turned to look at it, and it was me. Literally me. Same clothes and everything. But it was angry, like an animal. It looked at me with pure evil in its eyes, and I knew it wanted to hurt me. I covered myself with blankets, 
and after a while I slowly pulled them back, and it was gone. I looked around, settled back into bed, and somehow fell back asleep. Then it was on top of me again, growling and looking at me in anger. I was able, once again, to throw it off and watched as it slowly faded away. The next morning I saw my wrists had marks on them as if something had been holding on to them tightly. I told my dad about what happened, and he seemed to know all about it. He said that dreams are where evil creatures can take hold. That day he went out and bought me a dream catcher, which I keep by my bed to this very day. I have never had an experience like that since. Michael Blackstorm, Montana Michael, that is creepy and strange, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us. For those of you who don't know what a dream catcher is, it is a willow hoop on which is woven a net or web. The dream catcher may also include sacred items such as certain feathers and beads. Traditionally, they are hung over a cradle to protect the infant. It originates in the Ashinabi culture as a spider web charm. It's meant to replicate a spider's web. Legends held that the dream catcher would allow good dreams to pass through and float down the hanging beads and feathers to the sleeping child. We have a similar experience from Benjamin Reed, who, strangely enough, also lives in Montana. He lives in the city of Great Falls and sent this one in for us to enjoy. I have edited this and received Ben's approval. I have LED lights set up around my bedroom and leave them on during the night. I set them to red so the room is dark enough for me to sleep. I sleep in the bottom bunk of a bunk bed, but I have the room fully to myself. My brother hasn't lived in the house for two years now. One night I was sleeping on my stomach, my head tilted towards the other side of the room where a pile of boxes of my dad's stuff sits. I open my eyes and I see this creature who looks just like me on top of the boxes. It had the same hair, body, and proportions as me, but his eyes were completely white. I felt my heart start racing and suddenly the creature jumps to the ceiling and crawls to the upper bunk. It peers down from there looking at me. Then it looks up at the ceiling and moves insanely fast towards the ladder to the upper bunk and starts to climb an invisible portion of it. When it just reached the ceiling, there was this flash of white light and I woke up. My whole body was twitching and somehow I knew my soul had returned to my body. Then I fell asleep. Later, the events had me thinking that maybe the creature stayed in that top bunk the whole night, which is, when you think about it, kind of spooky. Benjamin Reed, Great Falls, Montana. That is another strange story and so very similar to Michael's. Creepy with no explanation other than maybe it was a dream? However, from your description, it doesn't sound like it because it appears it was all so real. Thank you, Ben, for your story. This next story was sent in to the website without a name or place of origin. However, the email address was from ESP The Truth Is Out There and was titled, I Jumped Out of My Skin, Literally. When I was 14, staying the summer at my granny's house, I slept on her sofa every night. Early one morning, I woke up and walked into the kitchen. The sun wasn't quite up, so the kitchen was still fairly dark. Granny's house is really old. The light fixtures were just bulbs that hung down from the ceiling on wires with a pull string to turn them on. I kept reaching for that dang string to turn on the light, but for some reason, I just couldn't manage to get the light to turn on. I wandered over to the window and looked out for a moment before turning back to the sofa. Suddenly, I heard the sound of the paper boy approaching to leave Granny's newspaper in the box right next to the front door. 
I hurriedly tried to get back to the sofa so that I wouldn't be seen in my undies through the window. It felt like my feet were just slipping around and my legs were like rubber when I tried to move, but I did manage to get back to the sofa, only to find that I was staring down at my sleeping self, lying face down still on the sofa. I was terrified. Without hesitation, in a panic, I jumped on top of myself and hoped for the best. At that instant, I jolted awake with a shock that ran through my chest. My eyes flew open, my fingers tingling, and I pulled in a huge, painful gasp for air. Next, I jumped off the sofa, for real this time, without caring if the paper boy saw my undies. I was alive and could not believe what had just happened. As time went on, I found out that this experience was nothing that unusual or anything to fear, and that it would happen to me a few more times. However, my re-entries were much more graceful after that first ordeal. ESP, the truth is out there. Incredible. I've heard these out-of-body experiences before, and each time I marvel at them. I myself have had lucid dreams that have felt like that, but nothing so surreal. Thank you for sharing this, and please write back so that I can give you your proper credit. Our last story comes from Mississippi by way of Houston, Texas. Helene Blair sent this story in via email and has titled it Bats, Shadow, Mice, and More. Here is her story. So my family moved to Mississippi when I was five years old, and let me tell you, it was not a good experience for me growing up in that yellow, gray, and green house. It was okay the first three days there, until it wasn't. It was Thanksgiving and my mom was cooking. It was cloudy and gray outside, so we three girls were watching cartoons and eating leftover marshmallows. That's when we heard it. It sounded like birds in the chimney, but as it got louder, it sounded more like screeching. It scared the heck out of us, especially when my dad told us that it was bats, not birds. He grabbed a big trash bag and held it at the entrance of the chimney. It was like any scary movie. There were so many bats flying into the bag that it filled right up. Some escaped, but in the end he got them all. The next day my dad called the landlord and told him what happened. They came over and fixed the entrance of the chimney. We didn't have any issues with bats after that, but this event should have been a warning to us that there was something wrong with this house. Things started getting more weird. We had a mouse problem. They got into almost everything, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. It started with me sleepwalking up to the second floor of our house and waking up in front of the mice hole on the wall. But what made it more weird is that it kept happening every night at 3 a.m. Sometimes I would wake up on the floor in front of it with my finger stuck in the hole. So creepy. At night we would hear footsteps in the house and I would see shadow people walking around outside. I told my family, but they said it was just a weird dream. Speaking of dreams, I had a recurring one of being kidnapped by shadow people in a white van where the windows were covered in white. They would remove all my fingernails. So dang scary. I never told my parents about this one because I thought they would think I was crazy. The strangest thing that happened was one night I was wandering through the house looking at things. Each time I would stop, pick up the item, turn it over in my hands. I would look behind me and see mice following me in single file, each looking up at me as if waiting to see what I would do next. Eventually I headed back to my bedroom. There I found myself soundly sleeping. I didn't know what to do. I reached out to touch me, and then it was morning. I kept having those experiences until we moved to another home. After that, all the strange stuff stopped. My mom told me some years later that she saw a soldier from either World War I or World War II standing over her bed, pointing a finger 
at her belly. She didn't know why the ghost did that, and she didn't want to know. Some years passed, and we moved to Houston, and my mom told us that the house we lived in, back in Mississippi, was haunted as hell. She told us that the house was sitting on a graveyard dedicated to Civil War and World War I victims. She never told me how she knew that. Colleen Blair, Houston, Texas What a story to end on. Out of body, dreams, ghosts, bats, mice, and shadows? So much to unpack from this one, and thank you, Colleen, for sharing it with us. I don't have much to say other than I'm glad that you're out of that ugly yellow, gray, and green house. I don't think we've ever had a story with so many elements. Well, those are your stories for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, like Colleen did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. And please tell me your name and where you're from. And also, don't forget to title your story. Make your stories our stories. Our featured story is a real treat. After a murder, Lieutenant Stevenson questions the dead man's girlfriend. Sensing that she's keeping a secret, he confronts her at home, where he meets an identical twin sister. Both women appear exactly alike, sometimes even posing as each other. However, when a twin expert analyzes the sisters, he finds that one twin is normal and the other is psychotic. But which one? The story comes from the OTR series Screen Director's Playhouse, and it is titled The Dark Mirror. It stars Olivia de Havilland playing the role of both sisters, and it first aired on March 31st, 1950. RCA Victor. World leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, proudly presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, star Miss Olivia de Havilland, production The Dark Mirror, director Robert Siodmak... Hollywood screen directors present a reflection on murder. The motion picture drama, The Dark Mirror, starring Academy Award winner Miss Olivia de Havilland. Tonight, Miss de Havilland recreates her original dual role in the film as she plays the twin parts of Ruth and Terry. In a fashionable Fifth Avenue apartment, Dr. Frank Peralta was murdered. Stabbed in the back. The only evidence of disorder was a shattered mirror. Arrested on suspicion of murder was Miss Terry Collins, Dr. Peralta's fiancée, and her identical twin sister, Ruth. Mr. District Attorney, we've been at this questioning for hours and getting nowhere. Now, look, identical twins, which one of you girls was with Dr. Peralta last night? One of us spent the evening at Jefferson Park, and the other... Never mind. How about you, sister? One of us stayed home. Uh, but which one did which is what I'm asking. Which one did which? One of us. That's what I've been hearing for hours. One of us spent the evening at Jefferson Park, and one of us stayed home... Dr. Elliot, you're a psychologist and authority on the subject of identical twins, and you're personally acquainted with these girls, and I'll I'd like to... hold it, what? Lieutenant Stevenson. I knew these girls one at a time. And they were working at the newspaper counter in my office building. I didn't know they were twins. Dr. Elliot, you knew Dr. Peralta and had conversation with him the day he was murdered. 
He asked you if you ever came across a case of split personality and whether it was dangerous. All right? Clarify that. I told him I couldn't say that he had to cite a specific case. Then he said I had a battle with her this morning and I'm seeing her tonight. Seeing who tonight? Miss Collins, I suppose. Which one? I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, where do we go from here, Mr. District Attorney? Nowhere. You haven't a witness that can tell one girl from the other. I wouldn't have a chance in court. Young ladies, one of you is a murderess. You've killed a man in cold blood. The other is an accomplice. But the law forbids the indiscriminate prosecution of more than one person in order to make sure of one guilty one. I have no words adequate to express my contempt for both of you. Now get out. We're free. You're free. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Au revoir, Miss Collins. All right, sit down, Doc. I'm a peculiar guy. I don't like the perfect crime, not even in books. So? You're a twin expert. Do you know anything, whatever, about these two dames that would give me a chance to begin work? Oh, sure. The crime. You don't just suppose anyone could commit a murder, do Look, you? Look, you're going to have to be very patient with me. Uh, just what do you mean by that? Character, personality. Not even nature can duplicate character. Even in twins. One of the Collins girls could, and one couldn't commit murder. That's all there is to it. Doc, do you often interview twins? Often. But not for the police. Yeah, 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 yeah. You like one of those girls. Now, suppose she's innocent, living with a killer. And one of them killed once with a knife. Don't you think there's a chance she'll kill again? Her sister, if she ever became nervous about her? There's no doubt about it. I'll never ask you the name or proof. It's out of the question, Lieutenant. I'm not a detective. Besides, I didn't say I was in love with the girl. I simply said I like her. How do I know she wasn't the one who did it? Come in. Hiya, Doc. Glad to see you. I'm Terry. That's Ruth. That simplifies things immeasurably. Thank you. It's been two weeks since we've seen you, Doctor. And surely you've seen the papers. We're celebrities now. And out of a job, too, I gather, Terry. And I don't know who'll hire us, either, after what the district attorney said. That's exactly why I'm here. You know, I'm an old twin collector, and I'm going to add you two to my collection. Twenty-five dollars a week apiece, and you appear in my laboratory three times a week for an hour. For science. What do you say, Ruth? I don't think we're interested. I don't like the idea of being a guinea pig. I don't want to press you, but if you're afraid... We have nothing to be afraid of, Doctor. Nothing but snoopers. Well, in that case, there's nothing more to be said. Ruth, I think we should do it. I don't think Dr. Elliot's a snooper, and we could certainly use the money. You don't mind being asked a lot of personal questions? Why should I, or why should you? We have nothing to fear. And we've always liked Dr. Elliot. Both of us. Ruth, I hope you can see things Terry's way. But if you can't, I'll understand and no harm done. Bye now. Ruth, what's the matter with you? You think that was very wise? Why? What are you afraid of? I'm not afraid. There's... Don't lie about it, Ruth. You are afraid. You're more and more afraid every day. Why? Terry, you know very well what it is. You think I killed him. Why don't you admit it? But I don't. You know I don't. Then why are you so frightened? Oh, Terry, if they knew which one of us was in Dr. Peralta's apartment that night, you know what that would mean. He proposed to me there. And I said yes. Why should I kill him? I know that, dear. I know you didn't do it. I know it so well that I'm willing to do anything to keep him from learning you were in his apartment that night. That's the only reason I'm frightened. Believe me, dear. Please believe me. Well, then, is there anything about yourself that you're afraid for Elliot to learn? Oh, of course not. Well, then, stop worrying. There's no need for it. And besides, he's very good-looking. I like him. After 
after all the tests we've made in this laboratory, Terry, I believe I can tell you and Ruth apart. Well, you're the first one who ever could. <laughs> who do you like best? Ruth or... Naturally you, Terry. Let's get down to business again. Now, these are pictures of ink blots. Just blobs of ink and the paper folded over. Tell me what you see in the blots. Why? That's just another way of examining personality. Hmm. This blot looks like a lamb. Under its front paws are two men, face down, with their arms outstretched. It all seems symbolic of something. The lamb looks so innocent, but it has two men under its paws. Symbolic of what? The lamb of death. Now, what does this blot represent to you, Ruth? Well, I see a drum majorette with a high bearskin shako. She's very graceful and light-footed. Mm. Your mind runs toward pleasantry. You know, you were telling me you always leaned on Terry. Yes. All my life, Terry's been like an older sister to me, always helping and protecting me. I remember once when I was about 16, I was crazy about a boy, Freddie Eklund. But Terry simply couldn't stand him. She said he wasn't on the level, and that's the way it turned out. He wasn't. Now, how'd you find out? He dated Terry one night, and she told me. Oh, but that's kid stuff. Let's try another experiment, Ruth. I'm going to give you some words. As soon as you hear the word, you answer with the first word that comes to your mind, you see? Mm-hmm. Table. Um... Chair. Lamp. Shade. Dark. Night. Mirror. Death. But Ruth, how could you have said it? When he said mirror and you said death, it proved you were scared. I didn't know. It just popped out. I don't understand. But I do. I understand some of that mumbo-jumbo, and it's a dead giveaway that it's still in your mind and that I had something to do with it. I'm not afraid of him. I can do that stuff 24 hours a day and beat him at it every time. It's you I'm worried about. But, Terry, I think you're wrong about Scott Elliott. He isn't trying to use me. He's pretty grand, you know. You're falling in love with him, aren't you, Ruth? Oh, you keep saying that to me all the time. Of course not. Well... Don't. Moon. Beams. White. Black. King. Queen. Death. Mirror. How is my character development, Doctor? Very interesting, my dear Terry. Perhaps you've read my mind well enough to know that I might like seeing you. That's a mighty fine invitation. But I'll have to wait until we finish our tests. All right. But the first night afterward, it's a date. You won't forget. Cross my heart. Bye now. Detective Lieutenant Stevenson, please. Hello. Uh, Scott Elliott, Lieutenant. I have some news for you. One of our young ladies is insane. Very clever, very intelligent, but insane. You have been listening to Act One of The Dark Mirror, starring Miss Olivia de Havilland and presented by RCA Victor. Nowadays, the most popular American sport next to baseball is the television boasting contest. Well, when you own RCA Victor's superb new 16-inch console, the TC-167, you'll win all such contests hands down. For this magnificent set is a champion on count after count. It's aristocratic cabinet. It's built-in antenna. It's phonojack for attaining, attaching any record player. It's glorious RCA Victor golden throat tone. As for the giant 16-inch pictures, they're RCA Victor's finest, which means the world's finest. When you unveil this RCA Victor champion to your awestruck neighbors and accidentally tell them the price, they'll think you're an investment wizard. 
Well, the suggested list price of the TC-167, slightly higher in some locations, is only $399.95 plus federal tax. And the returns on that investment, daily entertainment through years of that matchless performance synonymous with RCA Victor Television. America's first, America's finest, America's favorite. Now back to the Screen Director's Playhouse production of The Dark Mirror, starring Miss Olivia de Havilland in her original twin roles of Ruth and Terry with David Ellis as Scott Elliott. Ruth, did you spend the evening with Dr. Elliott? What? Yes. I warned you to stay away from him. He's trying to pump you. Oh, I'm sorry, but I can't help but think he's pretty trustworthy. Ruth, it's getting late. Why don't you go to bed, darling? Wake up, Ruth. I said, wake up. Wake up. What? What? What's the matter? What's the matter? He was sobbing hysterically. He was pretty harrowing for a few minutes. Oh, oh! You must be mistaken, Terry. The night wasn't the first time. It happened last night and the night before that. <gasps> don't you want to know what seems to be frightening you? Oh, I, I don't know whether I do or not. You keep repeating it over and over in your sleep. You're worried about one of us being. Crazy. Oh. oh, this is awful. It frightens me. The whole idea of talking and dreaming and sobbing and remembering nothing about it. Well, it can't be very pleasant. But it's really not so important. Just bad dreams. Oh, I, I don't know what to say. I... The night before last, you jumped out of bed screaming someone was putting the lights on and off. (laughs) Darling, the lights were never on. Oh, something's happening to me, and I don't know what it is. I don't understand it. (laughs) I'm worried about you, Ruth. I must watch you more closely before something dreadful happens to you. Oh, I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. (laughs) There, there. Just remember I'm with you. And I'm always going to be with you. No matter what happens. Well, Terry, this is one of your last tests. At the end of the week, I shall be forced to fire you. In other words, I can look forward to a date with you Saturday night? I'm afraid I can't make it. Who's my rival? You have no rival. Come on. Let's get on with the lie detector experiment. Hmm? You can ask me anything you wish. I have nothing to fear. I know that. You ready? Ready. Now, Ruth was telling me about a boy you knew in Ohio with whom she was in love and you didn't care very much for. Oh. Freddie Eklund. Why? What did she say? Well, she just said you told her he wasn't on the level and proved it. Was she complaining? Oh, good heavens, no. She looks upon you as her big sister. Did she tell you that I knew him first? No, I don't believe she did. Well, that's the truth of the matter. I met him first and introduced him to her. And he didn't care in the slightest for her, and I knew it. And then he started going around with her. Without her even dreaming for one second that it was actually me that he was interested in. Now I know the answer. Lieutenant Stevenson, I invited you to my apartment to tell you positively that Ruth didn't do it. She isn't capable of murder. Well, that does narrow it down a bit. Terry's a paranoiac. A paranoiac has no more conscience, no more sense of right or wrong than than a two-year-old. Paranoiac is capable of doing anything. Of killing her sister, Ruth? Yes. 
We must do something to protect her. All right. Get hold of Ruth right away and break the news to her. No matter how hard it is. All right, I will. And watch out for yourself. Or you'll be the new Dr. Peralta. Well, I don't figure very seriously in her calculations. She didn't mind those tests. They're just another challenge to her. Another opportunity to show the world what contempt she has for it. I still say, be careful, Doc. And tell Ruth right away. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Scott. How are you, dear? Ruth, are you alone? Yes. Why? Well, I don't want Terry to know. I want you to come to my apartment as soon as possible. It's vitally important. I'll be right over. Scott. What? Ruth. But I just talked to you. What? Never mind. I'm glad you're here. I saw the light in your apartment. I've been walking, and I thought... Why, you're pale, darling. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Something like that. Hallucinations. What causes hallucinations? Hallucinations? Things you imagine you see or hear. Oh, bad nerves. Just nerves. Or a sick mind. Yes, a sick mind. Ruth, there's something I must tell you, but you're too emotionally upset to hear it now. Darling, please, go straight home and relax. I have some urgent business in the next minutes. Everything's going to be all right. I love you very much. I'll be all right. Goodbye, Scott. Lieutenant Stevenson, please. Lieutenant, Terry Collins will be in my apartment in the next few minutes, pretending to be Ruth Collins. I don't have time to explain. All I know is that I'm going to play the role of a human booby trap. Stick by your telephone. Ruth, it's not an easy thing to tell you, but I feel that I should. Terry's not well. She's sick inside. And she needs your help. Sick? How? She's paranoid. She's twisted inside. That's absurd. I called you tonight because I want you to talk to her, Terry. I want you as the nearest and dearest to her to persuade her to go to her doctor and put herself in his care. And if I refuse to insult her with such incredible rot? But you mustn't. I can't tell you how important it is that she get this care immediately, Ruth. And if Ruth refuses? If you refuse, Terry. And you are Terry. I'm afraid I'll have to tell who killed Frank Peralta and why. There's nothing you'll be able to do about it. Whatever you guess. I'll remind you anyway. You killed Peralta because the same thing happened to you that has always happened to you before. Remember Freddie Eklund, the boy Ruth loved, who didn't want any part of you? Well, Dr. Peralta was in love with Ruth without even knowing she existed. How interesting. He romanced you and finally asked you to marry him. He didn't know there were twins. All he knew was that every now and then the girl at the newspaper counter brought him a warmth that he missed at other times. And that's what puzzled him. That's why he asked me about a split personality. You weren't aware of this until that night in the apartment when he spoke of this curious difference from time to time. Then you knew it had happened again. It was Ruth he was in love with, not you. So you made sure that if you couldn't have his love, neither should Ruth. Who else have you told this to? Nobody else so far. Terry, I implore you to go to your doctor and be guided. There's no necessity for that. There's nothing you can do about it. You're wasting your time. Haven't you forgotten Ruth? No. No one would take seriously the word of a girl who suffers from hallucinations. Or hasn't she told you? Just a minute. What do you mean by that? Oh, excuse me. I'm going to kill him. Hello? Oh, yes, Lieutenant Stevenson. I've got to kill him. I'll stab oh, him with these scissors. Right there he is. 
Ruth's dead. She's killed herself. Does that surprise you? I'm sorry, Doc. The body's inside that room with the medical examiner. Go on in. Can you tell me what happened, Lieutenant? An overdose of sleeping pills. Why'd she do it? Her conscience. But she's free now, poor darling. And I have a right to some peace, too. Come on now. Make a clean breast of it. You'll feel better. She killed him. She was twisted inside. Scott told me tonight. You mean Ruth? No, Terry. I'm Ruth. She was sick inside with jealousy. That's why she killed him, Scott says. Wait a minute. Can't get away with it. You're Terry. Now, Scott, I thought you said you could tell us apart. Well, the test showed only what I've known for a long time, that she hated me, hated me from the bottom of her heart, because men found it easy enough to like me, but not her. The mirror. The mirror! I see Ruth there! In the mirror! I'm sorry, Terry. She's not dead! Put down that vase, Terry. All right, Sergeant. Take her to headquarters. Somebody do something for me. Now, Terry, now. Save me! Take it easy now. Save me! Terry, Terry. Save me! I'm not at all surprised that she smashed the mirror. I'm sorry I had to fake Ruth's death, Doc, but well, it was the only way I could get Terry to open up. Under the circumstances, Lieutenant, I forgive you. Scott. Was the mirror me? The reflection was. That's what twins are, you know. Reflections of each other. Everything in reverse. What are they going to do with Terry? Don't worry, darling. She'll get the best that modern psychiatry can offer. Someday, who knows? Someday, Scott. There will be a someday for Terry. I know it. I know it. We'll be waiting for her, darling. You and I. You have just heard the last act of The Dark Mirror. And our star, Miss Olivia de Havilland, with our guest screen director, Robert C. Odmack, will be with us in just a moment. Ever hear of Hollywood astronomy? It's stargazing. Folks come out here and can't get enough of seeing stars. Stars in the street, stars in the stores, stars everywhere. But I've found myself an even better pastime. Star listening. Something you too can do. Hear all the greatest stars in the musical firmament on RCA Victor 45 records. You hear them easier, you hear them better. And you hear them at less cost on RCA Victor 45. You hear them easier because it's so much easier to play 45 records. They're so small. Only seven inches across, and the center opening that fits around the record changer mechanism is big. Naturally, the records are a pushover to put on. After that, one touch of one button gives you up to 50 minutes of music. And don't forget the easier storage of 45 records. Tuck them in with your books on ordinary bookshelves. RCA Victor 45 sound better because every note of music is recorded in the quality zone of the record. No distortion. And finally, the low cost will amaze you. A complete record player to plug into your present radio, Victrola phonograph, or television set for as little as $12.95. And 45 records start as low as 46 cents. But folks, I'm always of the opinion that seeing is believing. You should actually see the RCA Victor 45. Hear it and play it. Where? At your RCA Victor dealers. Do it tomorrow. Next Friday, another great star sounds the saber clash of high adventure on the screen director's playhouse. Our story is The Fighting O'Flynn, and recreating his original role will be Douglas Fairbanks Jr. with screen director Arthur Pearson. Now, here again is tonight's star... Miss Olivia de Havilland. Ladies and gentlemen, 
If it's permissible for an actress to step out of her story, then it's only right that her director step out from behind the cameras. And so I'd like you all to meet the director of The Dark Mirror and of such other films as The Killers, The Spiral Staircase, and The Phantom Lady, Robert Siodmak. Thank you, my dear. Thank you very much. But tonight, nobody wants to hear about directors. Oh, that's no way for the guest of honor to talk. No, the honor doesn't belong to me, but to the screen director's playhouse. The honor of a performance by an actor is so superb that she has won her second Academy Award. Thank you very much. Well, first, you won it for the award to each his own, and now for the heiress. But you know, they say in Hollywood that everything runs in three. So now you must do it once more. <laughs> Receiving a second Oscar is a thrill beyond explaining, but for the future, well, all I'm looking forward to is an opportunity to go on acting as well as I know how. And that gives us all something to look forward to. Good night, Olivia de Havilland. Good night. Good night, everyone. And good night to you, Miss Olivia de Havilland and Robert C. Odmack. Remember next Friday, Douglas Fairbanks and the Fighting O'Flynn with screen director Arthur Pearson, brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. <laughs> Nunnally Johnson's The Dark Mirror was presented through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, who soon will release One Way Street, starring James Mason, Marta Torrin, and Dan Duryea. Miss Olivia de Havilland is currently starring in Paramount's The Heiress. Robert Siodmak's latest production is the Universal International Picture Deported, starring Marta Torrin and Jeff Chandler. Included in tonight's cast were David Ellis, John Daner, Francis X. Bushman, Helen Andrews, and Frank Barton. The Dark Mirror was adapted for radio by Jack Rubin, and original music was composed and conducted by William Lava. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley and directed by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Friday when RCA Victor presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, star Douglas Fairbanks, production The Fighting O'Flynn... Director, Arthur Pearson. It's the great J. Rupert Durante, next on NBC. That story may seem like a retread to you, but I assure you that in the 1950s, it was first run. The Dark Mirror, the film, was released in 1946, making it even more groundbreaking. De Havilland, who played both sisters, had just begun to experiment with method acting at the time and insisted that everyone in the cast meet with a psychiatrist. How about that? The film was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Story. Now, if you think you may have missed a lot in the radio version, the movie itself was rather short, coming in at just over an hour. That was episode number 572. Our creepy stories this week were sent in by Michael Blackstorm, Benjamin Reed, ESP The Truth Is Out There, and Colleen Blair. My thank yous abound. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.